doctor. <laughs> My name is Jenny Wilson. When I walked into the bar this morning, somebody said to me, I remember you giving your resignation speech as PRO several years ago. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, here I am back again. But um, as a temporary measure, I'm hoping that um, we have a good week and some of you younger parents who are getting involved, and it's lovely to see so many of you here today, will think about stepping up and taking on some of these roles that we oldies have been doing for too long, probably, um, especially as I see some faces here that used to come to Wednesday Sailing when I was running it, and now they've got children of their own at the regatta, so <laughs> definitely time I stopped. Um, anyway, today I'm PRO for this week, which means I'm legally responsible for everything that happens on the water, so the buck stops here, person, effectively. Um, so I have this wonderful team, there's Joff, who is head of safety, um, there's Kate who has done an absolutely fantastic job getting everything organised on the on the shore side of things and I think we should give her a big round of applause for her. <laughs> she's, an <laughs> she's an absolute star, so um, well done Kate and I hope you're all going to support all the activities she's running over the week and make sure your children turn up and, and have a lot of fun. We want it to be a fun week. We don't want, it's not a national championships, it's not a serious week, but we would like the children to behave well, to be respectful of the people on the water. We won't be doing with bad language and bullying or anything like that. If anybody, if there is any of that, then they will come to me, basically. Um, I'm managing the bit on the water, so I talk to the race officers, we agree the sailing areas, and we look at the wind and the weather and so on with safety, and we, we come up with a plan between us as what's going to work. We can't tell you necessarily what time we're going to finish because how long is a piece of string? You know, it does. Sometimes it takes longer than others. So we do our best to, to sort of stick to um, guidelines. The fleet race officers each day will will talk to their teams and we'll talk to the parents and tell you what their plans are and what what they're expecting to do and when they're expecting to be in. So that's how that works. So anyway, I'm going to stop talking and hand over to John. Thanks very much, everyone. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm Joss, I'm the event safety officer this week. I, we do have a bit of a plan. We do have a bit of a safety plan. Um, <laughs> there you go. Right. Um, uh, so I'm just going to take you through it. Um, first of all, a massive thank you for being part of the event because we couldn't run it without you. We couldn't run it without your eyes on the water and your head's out of your boat. And actually that ability to keep your head out of the safety boat and just look at what's going on, predict what's going to happen and be there before it does happen is really, really important. So keep talking to your crew in the safety team boat, keep talking to your safety lead boat about what you're seeing um, and, and that everybody uh, should be safe as a result. So that's the biggest thing. Um, if you're in a rib that's not yours and if you get the chance, but you know, and there, lots of them are down on the pontoon already, um, do get a chance to familiarise yourself with everything on that boat and how it works and its little idiosyncrasies and all of that kind of stuff and the equipment you've got on it, that would be really good. And, and actually, if we've got time afterwards, um, we've got Optimus in the boat park, we've got all the fevers, we've got a fever in the boat park, the, there's a vision here, there's some club scows and some of the bronze fleet boats on the pontoon. Just familiarise yourself with the boats you're going to be rescuing, know how they get rigged and de-rigged, because the more you know now, uh, the better it will be in advance. Um, so uh, we have published, I, I, I believe Vicky's posted on the volunteer WhatsApp group, a detailed operational plan uh, for the week. I, I'm going to summarise that in, this, in, in, in the presentation we're going through, but do get a chance to read through the, op the operations that we've written. It, it is a framework that we'll be operating under, so it's worth being familiar with it. Um, so as Jenny's already said, uh, she's responsible for all, all of the participants and volunteers from the moment we go ashore to the minute we get uh, from the moment we go afloat to the minute we go ashore. Um, and, and then I've got two deputies, um, Roger Wilson and Vince Sutherland, um, and, and they're there to predict everything that's going to go wrong, tell me about it, and solve it before they need to tell me about it. Too much else. Um, and and then we've got the, the race officers. We've got Malcolm in Gold Fleet. We've got Roy in Silver Fleet. We've got Jill in Bronze Fleet and we've got Peter Schofield with the Scows. And, and, and they're responsible for everything that happens on their race course, including all of the safety. And, and they just delegate the management of the safety to the, each safety lead on each course. 
Um, and I don't know how many of these safety leads are here. So Bob Burney and Goldfleet, Bob, are you here? Stand up. Take a bow. Hello, Hello Bob. <laughs> Silverfleet Helen McAllister, is Helen here? Hi. Hey, hello. <laughs> Neil Warmby, Neil here? <laughs> Boo. <laughs> and Harry Barnett, is Harry here? There you go, hello Harry. Uh, so those are your safety leads. So that's the kind of, the, the structure and the roles and the responsibilities. So this is the timings for Monday. Um, kind of what happens afterwards is all dependent on weather and, 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 and everything else. But so on Monday, uh, we're going to have a briefing um, and, and a kind of roll call and handing out a rib keys and all of that kind of stuff. 8.30 up here, um, up in the bar and, and, and the balcony area. Um, and, and we'll do an overall briefing just for the day's plan. And, and then we'll split off into each of our safety fleets and do that. Please do attend those safety briefings. There will be some critical information in there. Um, practical stuff uh, there's going to be a lot of ribs on the club pontoons please try and berth them as tidily and respectfully as possible um, we'll hand out rib keys um, at, in the morning at the safety briefing each day so do make sure you hand those rib keys back um, it's worth refueling at the end of each day you will get given a, a fuel card it's worth not pushing it for more than a day or two to make sure you've always got fuel in that car so get in the habit of just okay I've used some fuel today I just need to top it up again um, so I think that's worth doing. Um, and I'm afraid lunch is not provided, so if you're going to need plenty of energy during the day, please make sure you bring your own lunch and anything you want to keep yourself going. So there's some practical stuff. Um, personal equipment. Uh, please bring a buoyancy aid and wear it at all times. Um, it is going to be glorious weather, obviously, so sun creams and hats, really important. Plenty of water. Uh, we might need some waterproofs. If you've got a sharp knife, it's always worth having a sharp knife on you in case you need it. Um, uh, some shoes, so uh, I tend to like wearing flip-flops but I've got to discipline myself next week and not wear flip-flops because I might hurt myself. Um, you know, and to, to back up what Jenny was saying earlier, um, plenty of smiles and encouraging words for the sailors. Um, the, the better they get on with us as a safety fleet, the safer they're going to be and therefore the more fun they're going to have during the week as well. And, and hopefully the better they'll behave because they kind of know us and know what, how we're going to respond if they don't behave brilliantly. So, uh, so yeah, do, do develop that relationship with the sailors because they're here to have fun and we're a big part of um, them being on the water. I tell a little... St um, uh, so I, I work for the sailability programme at the RYA and uh, there was a young autistic lad at Oxford Sailability who loved sailing and he was doing really, really well. But there was one set of volunteers he really didn't get on with at all. And it was the safety team. Because his only experience of the safety team was meeting them when he was in trouble on the water. And they were being quite firm and directive about what he needed to do and how quickly so they could keep him safe. He'd never actually met them in a kind of nice, friendly, smiling environment. Oh, hello, my name's Bob and I'm here to help you. And as soon as he did that on the shore... He was fine with them and he didn't mind them rescuing him. So actually I think that, that speaks to all of us. The, the better we know the sailors and the better we get on with them, the more likely they are to do what we want them to. So <coughs> briefings in the morning, we will do a register. Um, we will talk to you about the forecast and the conditions and what we're seeing. Um, hopefully if there are any issues or any learning from the day before, we'll touch on those. Um, we, we'll have made decisions about course areas and how we're going to get to those course areas, so we'll cover that. Um, at your safety leads will talk to you about where they want you on the course um, and, and any specific role that you're going to have allocated to you. Um, uh, we'll confirm the VHF channels to be used on that day um, and, and we'll talk to individual fleets about if there are any individual sailors who've got specific needs that we need to watch out for um, and we'll confirm all the timings for the day and make sure you've all got fuel cards and rib keys. So in other words, it's all the stuff that we can't kind of predict in advance. Um, so safety boats, I think everyone's aware of this, but minimum of two people on board, please. If, if, if you do get that request, so can we come out on the safety boat with you? Please make sure you speak to your safety lead first and pretty regularly, so just keep an eye out for the ferry either leaving or, or coming in. And, and don't assume that everyone else has noticed it. So if you do see the ferry coming in, just let your core safety lead know if they haven't already let you know that the ferry's on its way, because it's just, if you've had your head out of your boat and you've seen it first, there are probably some people that haven't so it's always worth highlighting. Um, as I said, the entrance to the Yacht Haven Marina it, is a key area because the boats coming out of the marina can't see all the dinghies coming up and the dinghies coming up can't all see all the boats coming out. So do make sure that area is patrolled and managed. Um, 
and that the, the, the red post at the, the first rock groin on the west of the river, it just particularly if we've got a southwesterly, which luckily we, you know, the first few days we haven't got during this week, but um, it, it, as boats come round that corner, they tend to just drift out into the channel um, and then start hitting all the, 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 the vessels coming up and down and the, and the traffic coming up and down. So do kind of watch that turn. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this year more than ever, I think the either side of the channel, particularly on the east bank of the, ferry, uh, of the river as we go out, is really, really shallow. So if we have got a low tide, um, and you've got dinghies, you know, the oppies might well be able to lift their dagger board up and drift out over the mud, um, but particularly in the ribs, it gets really shallow if you're too far out of the channel. So just watch all of that. Any questions about any of those hazards that we've got? Nick? Um, is the concrete barge and the pipe marked in? <coughs> I'm coming to that. <laughs> Good. So there's the ferry timetable. It, you know, we, as I said, you know, I, I don't expect m myself to remember that timetable, but there will be ferries coming in, there will be ferries going out. Uh, keep an eye on them. Um, hazards in Oxy Lake. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> um, there is a concrete barge under there, and there is an old pipe. Uh, if I'm brutally honest, I always forget which way round they are, um, but they're both marked. Um, and they've got boys on the end and sticks coming out at the end of them. So just do watch out for those. Um, and, um, it, uh, you know, Oxy generally is pretty flat. If you can guess where the slightly deeper bits are in the river when it's got water on it, you're, do it, you're a better person than I am. It's a generally just assume it's pretty flat. But there are some pretty large stones and rocks down there. So, it, you know, don't push it because they will do a huge amount of damage to your <coughs> propellers. Um, so... Yeah, and, and the, 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 the proxy is it's deep enough in oxy for us to use when it's 2.4 metres above chart datum. The cheap way of working that out is when the water's <laughs> lapping up against the walls on the bottom of the slipway, there's enough water in oxy, which is great when you're leaving. It's not so good when you're in oxy because you can't see the <laughs> slipway. But there will be someone here, so it's always worth getting someone to check. Where are we? <coughs> so... Uh, this is the bit about what to do when things go uh, slightly off-piste and, and not the way we want to, them to do. So, just in terms of managing safety on the water, th there may well be lots of situations we're asked to manage and try and sort out and resolve. If you know your limits. If you're being asked to do something that you're not comfortable with, you're probably beginning to make the situation worse. So just be really honest and say, actually... That's not for me. I'm not sure I can do that. So please know your limits and tell your course safety lead if you're getting close to what those limits in terms of what you, you feel comfortable doing. Um, always the, the sailor before the boat and, and any other equipment. It's the people we're interested in, the boats we can deal with later, and they're the reason we have insurance. So, so always put the person first. Um, it, it, I kind of, it goes without saying, but kind of drive safely at all times. We're the safety lead, so we're setting the example of everything that happens. Just have in mind uh, how cautious I need to be and how considerate of everyone else and how safe I need to be on the water. Um, please do wear your kill cord. It's really easy to forget at times. We all know those situations. And, and let's just get a culture going all week where if we notice someone's not wearing it, have a friendly word and just say, oh, I notice you're not wearing your kill cord. It's much better than feeling guilty about, oh, God, I've got being caught out again. So just that kind of culture of spotting when everyone else is not wearing their kill cord, let us know. Um, and, and then we'll all remember. But please do remember to wear your kill cord on. And, and the thing I always do is, I, you know, I'm untying the boat. I've got the engine running. I can't... I'll put the kill cord on once I've got just left the, the dock. But actually, that's when you really forget to put it on. So put it on before you start the engine. It's the key way of making sure you remember. Um, so... J and, and just be safe. You know, what do I mean by being safe? So, you know, know what support's available. You know, have lots of conversations with your safety lead about how things are going, how you're doing, how everyone else is doing. Ask for feedback. You know, that kind of conversation about um, and the support that's available to you is really important. As I said earlier, keep your head out of the safety boat and try and anticipate what, what might happen. That's the biggest thing we can do all week. Um, it's predicting the things that are going to go wrong that's the key. Um, you know, listen, be ready to help. Um, you know, there's a big team of us, so kind of get to know the team develop as a team during the week, be respectful of each other, all that kind of stuff, and try and solve those problems quickly. Um, you know, just be, be honest with yourself if you're fit and healthy enough to do everything that's been asked of you, and knowing your limits, as I said earlier, 
Um, we're going to have to be adaptable during the week, so please be adaptable if we need things to change. Um, you know, and, and the safety, we've got a safety plan. The safety leads will ask you what to do. If we, if we kind of stick within the frameworks that we've all agreed, we'll be definitely safer. Um, there are no such thing as stupid questions if you're not sure. If you're not sure, please do ask us. Um, have your right personal kit ready to hand and know how to use it. Make sure you're using it all the time. As I said earlier, get to know all the sailors. The, re the better the relationships, the better we'll be. Um, and, and, and as much as possible, try and be familiar with those boats you're rescuing. You know, the, the ability to quickly depower them when you come alongside and de-rig them safely um, uh, is really, really important. So if you're not sure, as I said earlier, there are plenty around in the boat park, um, and I'll be down in the balance pond. If people want to start going through the boats and how they work, or talk to your safety lead about how those boats work, um, please do let us know. Um, so in terms of accounting for us all on the water, there's an awful lot of us. So we will do a roll call at the safety briefing. But then as you go afloat, can you do a radio check with bridge? So we will have a bridge station, and I'll talk about bridge in a second. But do a radio check with bridge and tell them that you're going afloat with the number of people you've got on board. That's really important. And, then, and when you come ashore, confirm to bridge that you're returning to the shore. And that way we know we can count everyone in and we can count everyone out. So as we're launching, this is the kind of step-by-step -step process that will happen. The race officer will decide that he's ready to receive the fleet and he's okay for the fleet to launch. Um, the course safety lead will, be, will satisfy themselves that they've got enough ribs afloat for that fleet to safely marshal them to the course area and will go, yes, we can go afloat. Um, we'll, there will be a check that we've got a ferry that's about to come down the river. Um, the beach master... And their amazing team, Kate. <laughs> the beach master isn't actually here today, but she's um, Penella Punton, I'm sure many of you know. She's been fully briefed, she's got this document, she's been down yesterday, so she, I can't, I should have hold, held up a picture, but um, she'll be at the brief briefing tomorrow morning. Brilliant. Okay? So she'll be satisfied that they've got enough teams ashore to, to launch everyone quickly and safely, um, and, uh, and then, and then Fenella will let everybody launch. Okay, and at, at the point where every, that fleet has been launched, um, she'll tell uh, myself and the core safety lead how many boats went afloat in that, flight and that fleet, um, and the race officer will be informed both of the numbers but also the time of the, you know, roughly the time of the launching, particularly the last boat afloat, so we give everyone time to get to the race course. So that's the kind of step-by-step -step process that we'll follow when we're launching. At, at the end of the day... Um, it, Fenella and her team's job is much harder if we don't tell them that the boat's coming in. Um, it, it might be quite amusing to watch everyone run around trying to grab trolleys quickly because they've suddenly seen 50 oppies just do, turn up around the, the rock groin. But actually, the more notice we can give the beach team that the fleets are coming in, the better. Um, the sailors are accounted for as they return ashore because of the tally system that we've got going. Um, and the beach master will tell the safety lead when all of that fleet have been tallied at which point the safety lead will be able to stand the safety fleet down. Um, so up until the point where all the sailors have been tallied, we still need to be uh, you know, ready to be on the water and on the water and not stood down. We're still on, on station, if you like. <coughs> so we have got a bridge this week. Bridge sits there and monitors all of the radio communication that goes on um, and, and, and makes a note of all of that key decision-making and that key information. So... Yeah, key decisions, sailors retired, sailors coming ashore, all of that kind of key information they made it note of a log. Uh, and they're also a really useful um, bridge um, for all of the communication uh, out on the water to everything that's going on ashore. So if you want to contact Beach, if you want to contact anyone on the shore, um, doing it through bridge is the best way. Um, I, I, you know, and, and through the safety leads, we will be informing bridge of all of the retiring or returning sailors, um, and, and any casualties coming ashore particularly, we'll let them know. So that's generally communications and bridge. Um, some top tips for communication. I'm sure you guys all know this, but the, the biggest issue with radios is the kind of wind noise and water in the microphones. And, and it just means how, whatever you're saying and however sensible it is, no one can hear it. Um, and so if you've got a radio bag, please use it. If you've got some cling film wrap that around the radio. If you've got a sandwich bag, wrap that around the microphone because it makes a massive difference keeping the water out of that microphone and the wind off as well. Um, uh, you know, we will uh, we'll do lots of them to 
for the rest of the day, so lots of them will be done, but that makes a massive difference. Um, I, and, and the other tip that's actually is not up here is you know, the temptation often is to put the radio in a bag because it's a safe, dry place and you think it keeps it dry, but often the button then gets pressed and all everyone else can hear is a load of white noise. So, so try and keep the radios out of bags, not squashed. Um, just you know, plan what you're going to say. It's really, it, it is harder than it seems somehow. So do think about what am I saying? What's the key bit of information I'm trying to get across here? Always um, use the call sign of who you're calling and your call sign so everyone knows who you're trying to communicate with and, and who you are. Keep those messages concise and, and avoid too much chat. I know the chat happens from time to time um, and, uh, you know, and there's some nice banter that goes on, but actually it's there for a kind of safety reason, so avoid too much chit-chat over the radios. Are the call signs on this sheet? Are they the pink 15 or the bloke name? Yeah, the, pink, the, the flag number is the... Yeah. Have we got a list of call signs on the actual rib? Sometimes it's hard to remember. Yeah, so you'll, you'll have a flag on the rib. So the call sign will be the, if you've got safety, if you've got pink 15, that's your call sign. So your flag will be your call sign, so you'll always see that. So, yeah, there will be a list of call signs. We'll give you that list. Yeah. Um, so getting to and from the sailing area, um, ideally we've got a safety boat leading the fleet and a safety boat bringing up the rear of the fleet. Um, and if, if you've got some stragglers who've been really late launching, it's really unfair on the rest of the fleet to be held up. So the, the course safety lead will just need to agree a plan for those stragglers. Um, and then other safety boats spread throughout the fleet, um, encouraging stayers to stay out of the channel and watching all the traffic that's in the river. So we've got the yellow boys um, as we get up towards the yacht haven and then just encouraging them to keep out of the channel as much as possible. Pay attention to all those hazards in the river that we talked about. Um, we've got the deputy safety boat, so that's part of the problems they'll be solving is a lot of the traffic in the river um, and, and managing those points. And, and if, you've got, um, if you've got the capacity to have you know, that area around the yacht haven and the area around the red post at the rock groin, those are the problems areas, so if you can leave safety boats there just to manage the traffic as they come through that area that can really help um, and then once in the Solon th this sounds obvious but take the most effective route to the sailing area so I've definitely seen safety boats um, tap wires out into the Solon taking the fleet with them against the tide and the racing starts about an hour late because it's taken everyone a long time to get there so just be aware of what the tide's doing and what the most efficient route to the sailing area is um, uh, that's always good um, you probably can't see that. So the, if, if we do need to cross the river, if we're going out to the east, if you're going out to one of the east sailing areas, um, uh, it, there's a kind of crossing point that we always use just past that red post um, on the, the rock grind on the west, um, and we sort of cross over to the area kind of round about where that rock grind is on the east as well. Um, and um, so that's the best point. You, what you can do is, you, what we're trying to do is protect sailors from the traffic as they're crossing the river, and we're also trying to protect the, 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 the other river users and making sure their passage is as safe as possible. And they've probably got slightly less manoeuvrability and control over what's going on than we have, so we do have to be respectful. Um, what you can do is post a rib either side, uh, if we haven't got any marks out there, um, at the, and get the sailors to sail around both ribs. And, and you have to be quite firm and friendly with your communication to the sailors. I want you to come around this rib because you've worked out exactly the most efficient way to get across the river. So, so do kind of keep that chat going with all the sailors. Don't, they'll start following the person in front, and if the person in front doesn't go around the rib, they'll all stop going around the rib. So keep that going. Ideally, we'll have a couple of training marks out there, so there are some flags for people to sail around. So do make sure they sail around them. That red line, if you can see it at all, is only an indication of where the crossing point is. Um, but that's where we'll do all the crossing. It's the quickest, safest, and easiest place. Um, if we've got any casualties, whether they're kind of walking wounded or actually, heaven forbid, that we need the emergency services, we're going to be using the club, the outer club pontoon, so that's the drop-off off point. So any situation that needs managing, try and attend to the situation as quickly as possible, ideally within three minutes. If anyone wants to know the logic of why it's three minutes, I can chat about that afterwards, but try and get to situations as quickly as you can and do a head count. Are there as many sailors in that boat as you're expecting? That's the key thing you're doing first of all. And then assess whether intervention is needed. You, you know, a lot of this, capsizing is part of sailing, 
and, and a lot of the sailors will be used to capsizing and they'll get those boats up really quickly and they'll be off. But So just assess whether any support and intervention is needed. And, and communicate with the sailors, find out what they're thinking, and, and, and if you need to intervene, tell, start telling them what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it. So just communicate with them. So that's for everything. Um, kind of towing is always problematic. We're going to, I've got some slides later where we talk about how to tow each of the boats, but only with the permission of the course race officer, because if we tow one of the boats, we're going to be towing them all. Um, the risk is if we start towing some and not others, that's when we start losing boats out there. Um, and, but that's obviously, if you're, taking, if you're needing to tow a boat back to the mothership, um, that, that's obviously fine, but you'd have told your course safety lead and the, and the mothership that you're doing that anyway, so that, that's all good. Um, there will be times when you need to pluck a sailor out and get them to the mothership to get them warm as quickly as possible and leave the boat where it is and come and pick it up later. Um, do use some of the red and white tape that we'll hand out in the morning. Um, and, and attach it to the pin tools and the gudgeon in the back of the boat so that anyone else who comes across that boat floating around the Solent knows that actually there is not a sailor in it. Um, it's really, really important because if, if there's an upside down boat and it hasn't got the red and white tape on it, we will start a search for a sailor. Um, so, so do put that red and white tape on if you have taken boats out and had to, taken sailors out and had to abandon the boat. Um, get the sailors to the mothership as quickly as possible um, because that's the, the place where we can warm them up and get them comfortable um, uh, as quickly as possible. Then there will be times when we might need to get them straight ashore, but, but ideally, mothership first. And as I said, red and white tape on the pin tool. Um, we will, the, either the motherships um, or sometimes a boy out there will have a floating line on it where we can attach all the boats that we're not going to be using either for the next couple of races or for the rest of the day. So we don't have to bring them all in individually. We can attach them to those floating lines. Um, so if boats are retiring, just, you know, the, 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 boat them, the sailor themselves will let you know that they're retiring. I, and, and it's not, you know, race officers in the room will tell me I'm completely wrong here. If you're really seeing someone struggle and, and you think that they're, getting, they're just getting colder and tired here, but they're determined to finish the race because they think they're going to be in trouble with whoever it is ashore because they're not finished the race, you, you can intervene and say, why don't you retire? Why don't we sort you out? get you ready for the next race. It, you know, actually, our job is to help keep people safe. And we've got some really young sailors out there who feel all sorts of expectations and pressure. So, so don't, you know, don't feel bad about intervening and saying, do you think maybe you should retire um, if you think you need to? But you know, uh, ideally, the sailor will tell you that they'd, they'd like to stop racing this race. Um, assess whether you need to get, is it a case where I need to get them to the mothership quickly because they're so cold and wet, um, and I'll come and sort the boat out later. Um, if the sailors are removed, yeah, as I said, leave it attached to a buoy and put the sailor on the mothership. Um, the safety boat or the mothership informs the safety lead that we've got a sailor that's retired from the race, and that will just trigger the race officer knowing and, and bridge knowing and all of those things. Um, confirm which race course you're on um, and identify the, sail by the, the, the sailor by the sail number um, much easier than the tally number because the tally's probably under a wetsuit or something. So and everyone forgets their number. So, but if you do know the tally number, that's, that's equally as useful, but sale number's easier. And, and uh, the, please don't, the safety lead will need to um, uh, agree a plan for getting all of those sailors on the mothership back to the shore, um, and at the end of the day, getting all those boats back to the shore as well. Uh, there's nothing uh, so frightening as uh, a group of parents on the shore going, where are my boats? So don't forget to bring all those abandoned boats back in. Um, and... Um, if we've, if we've got any retiring sailors or boats that we can't account for, um, we, we will need to start. Is the priority, the boats or the children? <laughs> it's the children first, but please don't forget the boats either. <laughs> um, so sailors in the water, you please do recover them and put them back in their boat if need be. That, that, that's an in immediate risk to their safety. They can, if you've had to pick them up and put them back in their boat, they can carry on racing. You just need to tell the race officer that that's what's happened. That's a perfectly okay intervention. Um, I, and, you know, it, the water's as warm as it, pretty much as warm as it's going to be this year, but people will still get cold. So do kind of just assess how cold is the sailor. Do I need to actually, are they at the point where we need to start warming them up a bit? Um, and, and get them out of the elements and get them onto that mothership. So that's always just worth checking. Um, we, we've got all sorts of boats out there. Um, my general rule of thumb is if a boat can capsize and get knocked over to 90 degrees, it's got every chance of going all the way, and therefore we do have a risk of an entrapment. 
Um, so if, you, if when you arrive on the scene you can't locate that sailor immediately, kind of assume that they're underneath and write that boat as quickly as possible. So the, the simplest way to resolve an entrapment situation is get that boat back up to 90 degrees so you can get the sailor out. So write that boat as quickly as possible. That's the key thing. Um, so if we've got any first aid situations or injuries out there, let the safety league know. Um, if you're a first aider, provide some first aid. Um, assess whether for any you know, further first aid is needed or medical support is required ashore. Um, if it's a head injury and you're worried at all, get the sailor from the water, either to the mothership or, or, or back to the shore so that they can be observed properly. It's pretty difficult for you to kind of assess how bad is this injury, head injury. If you're really not sure, get them on the mothership and we can keep an eye on the sailor from there. So if, if, if in any doubt, just stop people sailing. Um, this is where having wet notes or anything is useful. Just record the details of any injury that's happened um, and any treatment, that, any first aid treatment support that you provided. Um, and if it's a sailor, if it's an injury that's not an emergency um, and, and we don't need to get them back ashore, just, just let the safety league know that this is what you've done, this is the support you've provided and the sailor's carrying on, but we just, we've got a record of it. Um, and because that enables the safety lead when they come back ashore to have a word with any parents or any supporters on the shore to say this is what's happened, this is the treatment we're giving and this is what we recommend you do. So it's just always worth knowing what you've done. Um, and, and, you know, uh, it, it means we can keep an eye on sailors just to check that they're not getting worse. We, sometimes we think things are really minor, but actually as the day gets on, um, things progress. So it's, it's important that we can monitor them when we get ashore. So we will have lots of other vessels out there. Keep a lookout for other vessels coming in or near the sailing area. Um, they're perfectly entitled to sail around the sail area, sailing area. They're perfectly entitled to sail through the sailing area. Um, uh, so it, it's about having a friendly conversation with the skipper of that boat and saying, this is where we're racing, this is where the boats are going to, what are your intentions, how can we help you get from A to B as quickly and safely as possible. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's that friendly conversation with all of those other vessels. Uh, and then also what you're also subtly doing is positioning yourself between that vessel and all of the sailors um, so that the sailors bump into you first. Uh, rather than the big vessel. So, so it's those two things. It, it's friendly, having a friendly word with any vessels coming through the sailing area and trying to manage that situation, but also positioning yourself so you're protecting the safety fleet, as much, the, the sailors, as much as possible. Um, <coughs> boats do break down. Safety boats do break down. Um, you do lose manoeuvrability. Occasionally, people run out of fuel. It's embarrassing, but it does happen. Um, just tell the safety lead. Don't try and make, you know, tell people as quickly as possible that you've got a problem because otherwise it's going to get worse. Um, anchor, if, you, if you've got that anchor and it's tied on and all of those things. Um, more up to a buoy if, if anchoring is not possible. There are some buoys out there. Um, and, and, and when the course safety lead is able to, they will free up another rib to come and either give you some assistance, tell you ashore, whatever it may be, get some fuel to you, whatever it might be. May, may I add, uh, please, that a boy does not include one of the marks. <laughs> a, a minor point, Malcolm, a minor <laughs> point. <laughs> um, so fog and loss of visibility. And always have a bearing from a known point. That, that's usually the river mouth, but it actually might be that if you're, if you're in and around Oxy or Pywell or any of those areas, just know how to get to, to the, into the lake safely because actually... If they're in Oxy or in Pywell, there's three sides that's covered by mud and all we have to do is sort of defend one side of the lake and keep everyone in there. So actually have a bearing to a known point of safety. Um, the, the safety, if there is fog coming, I mean often you can see it's coming, it might come quite quickly, but the safety lead and the race officer will come up with a plan of what they're going to do uh, and they will let you know um, and they will tell you what positions to take up. Um, uh, effectively what we're doing is asking the sailors to, to stop what they're doing at an appropriate point and, and, and start following the ribs to that point of safety. So we're, we're asking them to kind of gather as a group and, and follow a rib back to that point of safety. Um, so uh, as soon as that starts happening, your job as the safety boat is to start counting the boats around you, ideally making a note of all the sail numbers so we can work out, are we missing any boats and if so, which boat are we missing? Um, and, and then the, and letting the safety lead know how many boats you've got around you so the safety lead can calculate, have we got everyone or are we missing somebody? 
um, uh, it, it, the safety lead decides whether to tow home or not. You get two types of fog. You either get fog with absolutely no wind, in which case towing home is probably the quickest, or you get fog with absolutely loads of wind, in which case towing home might make things ten times worse. Um, so the safety lead will decide on the plan. Um, uh, it, it's about, if it's not uh, if, it's, uh, if, if it's still okay to sail ashore, it's about going ashore in those small groups, but keeping everybody in sight of a safety boat. Um, and, uh, you know, if somebody capsizes, everybody stops, so you still keep... It's, that starburst situation is the worst. You know, one boat capsizes, the safety boat goes to look after that capsized boat, the other six in your group have gone, and you don't know where they are. So that's the worst situation. Keep everyone together. Um, um, if you're towing, only start towing home when all of those boats are accounted for because as the safety boats, you're the resource that gets everyone ashore if we're towing. So let's not start towing until we know we've got everybody on a tow. Um, I mentioned if the cap size. Um, and the, 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 what the race officer and the safety lead will do will be what's the best way of getting everybody to a safe point. So actually, if everybody's racing, abandoning the race might be the worst thing to do. Um, because the sailors can actually still see the next marks, ideally, and getting back to the, the finish line might be the safest place to start gathering everyone. If you stop the racing in the, you know, as it is, everyone just starbursts. So actually the safety lead and the race officer will just decide, do we shorten it at the top of the, uh, a sensible mark? Do we get everyone back to the finish? In this, because that's going to be the quickest way to do that. So they'll let you know. Any questions about fog? I'm rattling through this. Um, strong wind, kind of really, really similar. Um, you know, the, 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 the safety leader will agree with the race officer, actually, it's got too windy, we need to do something about this. Um, they'll come up with a plan, and, and again, that starburst situation is just as relevant, so they might well try and get people to sail to, to a sensible point um, uh, so we can start gathering everyone, um, and, and we'll just gather everybody up together and start proceeding ashore. Um, uh, and again, it's about those sailors staying close to those safety boats, accounting for all of the sailors, um, and, and if you, you have a capsize or someone gets into trouble, everybody stops so you can, can look after and still account for everyone. It's all, the safety leads, it's always worth having you know, an extra rib that, that can help solve some of those problems. So if you've got someone who's not involved in shepherding a group ashore, they can be the problem solver if problems do occur. Um, and, and yeah, as I said, similar. Um, you know, we're just trying to avoid that starburst situation if we do get strong winds. Um, if we do lose someone, effectively, um, the safety lead, uh, you know, if, if it's happened uh, at Tally or Beach, we will just start a search as quickly as possible, which is why you need to kind of be on duty until Tally's told us uh, we've got everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's on the water, the safety lead will note the last position we saw that person, we'll work out what the conditions are doing and the tides are doing, um, and we'll start a search. Uh, and you'll be told by your safety lead what, how to start that search. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that's what we do. Uh, um, and if it's if, if as it, we get back to the launch area, we, we'll just have to go back out and find people. I'm afraid. So code red situations. So if you if you arrive at a situation and someone needs more support than you're able to provide them, uh, that you know they need a, you know, they probably need medical attention. It, it's first aid beyond what you're able to provide, and, and this person needs immediate assistance. Um, you broadcast to all of the other stations across the radio code red, and you just give your location where you are on the course. The next nearest safety boat works out that they're the next nearest safety boat and proceeds immediately to that code red situation to offer any assistance that they can. All other, radio, all other stations and all other safety boats minimise radio contact as much as possible because the really important communication is now happening about how can we manage this situation, not where everyone else is. So try, the, there may be things that you need to communicate, but do try and minimise it as much as possible. The safety lead will get there as quickly as they can and assess the situation, and their job is to work out, do, do I need to call in extra resources? Do I need to call in the Coast Guard? Do I need to call in extra safety boats? Do I need to include call in any of the deputy safety leads. Um, <laughs> they'll be there. They'll be there. <laughs> you know, and they'll help stabilise that situation and, and just manage it on the water. And, and as I said, we'll you know, request the emergency services to attend if we need to. Um, 
It's about keeping... The temptation is everyone rushes over to try and help that situation, but actually we've got a load of other sailors who still need looking after. So most of you, if you're not the first boat at the scene, one of the, sa the safety leads, or that second boat at the scene, your job is to look after everyone else and keep them safe because they're just as important. Um, and between the safety lead will keep the, you know, myself and the deputies and Beach informed about exactly what's going on. And, and the code red situation is closed when it's been resolved and the danger has been removed and or we've got that person ashore and, and, and that will be broadcast over the radio that it's been being resolved um, so we will tell you that it's been clear any questions on code red it's not going to happen I hope so just some good practice stuff um, I talked about towing one towing them all um, towing does take time so be aware of that build in that time to do it um, and, and it's important to take the time to get it right. The worst thing is rushing a tow, realising you haven't tied that round turn and two-off hitches right, and it comes undone, um, and, and you've suddenly got a sailor drifting off. Um, so, yeah, take the time to get it right. Use a strong point on the boat, and we'll talk through the different boats in a minute. Um, you know, the kicker's off. If, the, if you're leaving a sail up, get that kicker off, you, and the main sheet loose. You don't want any power in that sail. Um, if, if you've taken the rig down, secure the loose rig and the sails and the foils. And there are two reasons for that, this. The main reason is it's much safer that way because actually a boat on a tow with a mast that's half dipping in the water or a, a blade, a foil that catches the water is then going to capsize and cause you more problems. Um, and, and it's back to the angry people on the shore about boats not being returned properly either. But actually it's much safer if everything is secured neatly and tidily. And I know it's hard to do in a rush of putting a tow together but actually the neater you can secure everything in that boat, the safer it's going to be. Um, if you're towing uh, with people in the boat, remove the dagger board or halfway up, depending on the boat you're in and how easy that is. Um, you've got two people on the rib, so one person's making sure they're driving in the right way and, and avoiding all the posts in the river, and the other person is looking back at the tow and making sure everyone in the tow is doing fine. And you're communicating all the time about where you're going and how everyone's doing at the back. So it really does become teamwork in a tow. Um, again, if you're the safety lead, if you can keep one rib free from towing anyone, they can sort out the problems as they occur or if they occur on the rib. Um, floating lines for tow ropes are way better. Now, most of the painters on the boats that are used for tows should be floating lines, uh, and all of the club ribs, for example, will have floating lines in them, and you can use those for tow ropes if you need to rig up your own. Ideally, sailors are in the boat balancing the boat, and they know how to do that, and they know what feels comfortable. And, and the last boat steers. I always tell them just to follow the engine of the rib um, uh, so that then, then the whole tow stays in line as much as possible. Um, club oppies, I'm going to quickly rush through. Some people might correct me on some of these. There's lot, everyone's got a different theory about how to tow stuff. Um, the club oppies, the plastic oppies and the Hartleys that we've got down on the pontoon, round turn and two half hitches around the tow straps is much the quickest. If you tie a bowl in, you're going to find it really hard to undo that tow because by the time you've got six plastic oppies that you're trying to undo on a bowling, it's pulled pretty tight. So a round turn and two half hitches. Um, they're difficult to tow if they're empty. So ideally you've got some sailors in there to give a bit of stability to that tow. Um, racing oppies, this is always the one that gets everyone, and I'm really happy to demonstrate it afterwards if anyone wants to. Basically we're daisy chaining them. Each painter has got a loop in it that's about a metre in front of the mast. Um, so the first boat to the rib is actually going to be the last boat in the tow. So you take that first point, boat and you get to the end of the painter and then the second boat comes to the rib and you tie the, the, the end of the painter of the first boat to that loop that's a metre in front of the mast on the second boat and then you drop them back and you take the end of the painter of the second boat and you tie it to the loop of the third boat and so on and so forth. And a round turn and two half hitches is the best not to use as well. Um, I, it, I know, it's really tricky. The, there are some slight variations on it. That's my favourite because it's the easiest for the sailors to undo um, and it's less pressure on the front of the boats as well. So if anyone wants that demonstrating, if you're rescuing oppies this week and you want that demonstrating, come and find me afterwards and we can have a look at that. Um, the vision has got... Um, uh, uh, the club visions, there's three of them. If you're looking after the fleet with the club visions... They've got floating painters on the front, floating line painters on the front, um, and, and I think they're just about long enough to do a round turn of two half inches around the toe strap. If not, you're using your own toe rope on the rib and setting up a herringbone toe 
good old classic herring by toe on, on that. So those are the visions. Um, uh, terrors, tow ropes to the tow straps. Okay, so they've got floating line on that, and the, they will have a tow rope that goes round, turn two half hitches round the tow straps. Um, they're really difficult to tow if they're empty. So those abandoned terrors at the end of the day that have had the rigs beautifully stored and all the foils lashed down to the boat. And if it's a flat calm, you might just about manage to tow those home forwards when they're empty. It's much easier to have sailors in them. Um, they probably tow okay backwards, empty, but you would need then to go have the tow. You need to have the tow set up on the tow straps. Um, but they they might well tow backwards, okay. But but think about that when you're recovering those terrors. There's nothing worse than capsizing a bunch of empty boats. Um, uh, when you're towing them home, that causes a load of problems. You can't drop the mainsail on the terror. You, you can drop the mainsail on the, ta the terror. Yeah, you can, or, or it rolls up around the mast. Yeah, it rolls up around the mast and the boom and everything gets... You just use the main sheet to lash everything else down on the terror. <laughs> um, the fevers. So um, you're the, the painter of the boat behind... Um, so each... each uh, it, the, the, the tow lines on the fevers are attached on a bowline around the mast. So the mast is the strong point, and, and the boat behind you're attaching to that tow line around the mast. So you're doing a round turn and two half hitches around the loop of the bowline, not around the mast. It just reduces the pressure on the mast and reduces the weight of the tow. So, so you've got a, a, a tow line attached to the mast going forwards. The tow line from the boat behind goes onto the loop of the bowline that's around the mast, if that makes sense. Again, we've got a fever downstairs in the balance pond if anyone wants to have a look. Um, scales, tow rope to the thwart, round turn and two half hitches. Um, lift the centreboard, except for the last boat, where they can have half of it down or, or, or most of it down, just to give a bit of steerage. Um, usually lower the mainsail. Um, it, if it's an absolute flat calm, you can get away with that lowering the mainsail, but, but otherwise that sail's going to catch the wind at some point, and then you've got all sorts of trouble. Um, they do tow empty, because there's enough... There's enough of a V at the front of the boat to give it some steerage, so they, they tow okay, empty. Um, uh, the only other boat that we've got on the water that, that might cause some issues is the laser. They often don't have a tow rope on them. Um, some do, but some don't. So you might need to use the main sheet as a tow rope. Um, just ask the sailor to take the main sheet off and use that as the tow rope. Um, and you're probably going to struggle if you get if you if you're not really experienced at towing lasers. I wouldn't try and tow more than three at once. I think there are only three out there, so it's not going to be an issue this week. <laughs> Did everyone hear that? So if the, the club oppies don't all have tow straps anymore because we enjoy just watching the sailors flip out the side. It's really good. <laughs> but they, they will have a loop there instead that you can tie the tow rope to. So they'll all have, they've either got the tow straps or they've got a loop. Thank you for that. See you on Monday morning. <laughs> Should be fun. Gives you the secret code. They, you give no. If the sailor comes up to you and says you're Wally, they give you give them the secret code. They give the secret code to the beach on return, and they get a spot prize. Okay. So there will be a safety Wally system going on. It's a spot the difference for their kids. Yeah. So they'll be on a different course each day. So we'll do that. Um, any other questions? Definitely, and that, that goes for all the, it's a really good point, it goes for all the ribs as well. If you've got any problems or things not working as they should, let us know and we'll, we'll start coming up with a plan to fix it. And it's probably really easy and we can do it ready for the next day. It might take a bit more work than that. So any problems, any breakages, let us know. I'm just going to say, any shore volunteers, if you would like to get up from your chair, we'll do a little briefing down in the marquee when, in five minutes, if that's okay. Thank you. It's a lovely fit. So, but, so we have got slots on the water, particularly on committee boats. If you know anyone who wants to get out on the water and sit on a committee boat, it's usually pretty good fun, actually. Lots to do, and you get lots of banter with the sailors as well. So, so do, you know, if you know anyone, we've got some slots on the committee boats. Um, and then uh, if anyone wants to learn how to daisy chain an oppy or just familiar themselves with the boats wander around the pontoon and, and look at the ribs, please do. And thank you very much. Cheers, everyone.